and the sky went black. Tales and history of a longbow with Henrik Arnstad and Adam Westlund. Most welcome to the, the podcast And the Sky Went Black, which is uh, about uh, the longbows, the history and the tales of the, the, the longbows in a historical perspective. I'm with uh, Mr. Adam Westlund here. Hello. Hello. Uh, and you're a historian focusing upon medieval times, right? Yes, that is true. I have a master's degree from Stockholm, Uni- Stockholm University. And what did you write about in your master's degree? My master paper was about views on warfare in 14th century Sweden. Well, that, that sounds uh, perfect for our podcast. And you also work at, the, at museums in Stockholm talking about medieval warfare, is yes. that right? Yes, I work as a tour guide, for example, in the medieval museum. Excellent. And my name is Henrik Arnstad and I'm into modern history after 1789 and 1800s and so on and so forth. So I, I, I'm not as good at medieval history as you are, but, but I'm sure you will guide us through this period excellently. I hope so. Uh, and we're going to make a podcast about primarily the English longbow, is that right? Yes. What is a longbow exactly? A longbow is a bow that... Of course, a bow and arrow, which is a very old weapon system, but a longbow is a specific kind of bow that gets its force from its size. So you can create a bow that is smaller, that creates its force by using different materials, that we usually call a composite bow, but a longbow is a self-bow. It's made of one piece of wood and it is long, as the name implies, which gives it strength. Uh, um, and we also talk about the, the Welsh and the English longbow. Is there something special about those bows? Yes, um, you could say that generally the weapon is basically the same since much earlier than we usually talk about the English or Welsh longbow. The specific aspect is how the weapon is used. You, we see new battlefield tactics emerging in the 14th and 15th centuries that have not been used before. So even though the longbow as a weapon has existed for much longer than that, we see it as an emerging force on the medieval, late medieval battlefields. And that is how it came to be associated very heavily or strongly with Wales and England. That's right. Uh, so what are the beginnings of this weapon system? How, how did it come to play such a strong role in, in for example, English history? Well, um, bows and arrows have been used in warfare for a very long time, and even longer for hunting, of course, but very quickly people realized that it could be good to reach the enemy with bows. This was done in antiquity, this was done in all the old cultures, but um, what happened during the, one, the Hundred Years' War was that the English and the Welsh, or the Welsh as part of the English army generally, um, started amassing archers, shooting large volleys of thousands of arrows at the same time. And this had been built up gradually uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, we see several examples from the 14th century in England where English kings uh, created new laws in which boys were forced to practice archery several times, or once a week at least, to build up a competence pool that would last and which could be used by England in times of conflict. Could you tell us something about what was England in those days? Uh, the sort of late medieval England, mm. there's, there's something happening in 1066, for instance. Exactly. So this is, of course, a very broad topic, so we have to, to make a short version of it. But you could say that before 1066, England was uh, what we usually call Anglo-Saxon England. It was ruled by an Anglo-Saxon elite uh, that had been... Uh, England was conquered by the Anglo-Saxons gradually, or they moved in. The new theories are more about migration. But England had been Anglo-Saxon for hundreds of years. But in 1066, the the Norman nobleman 
Will, William that we usually call the Conqueror nowadays. William the Conqueror. William right. the Conqueror led his army across the English Channel and defeated uh, the English King Harold in the Battle of Hastings. Of course, this might not be a very dramatic turn of history because you already had very strong ties between the French and the English royal families, so usually it's portrayed as more of a drastic turn than it actually was. But still, Harold was defeated and killed, William became uh, king in England, and a new elite of Norman, French-speaking uh, noblemen came into England, and this of course changed uh, society quite drastically. Did the Normans use the bow on the battlefield of Hastings? Yes, uh, William's army had bows in Hastings, while uh, Harold's did not, according to most sources. So Harold's army was completely made up of infantry, they created a shield wall and they tried to hold a hill, while William's army utilized a combination of archers and cavalry. So the idea is that you fire arrows towards the shield wall and they're very tightly packed to be able to defend effectively against cavalry. They're standing very close together, shielding each other with their shields. And when you fire arrows at this formation, you're bound to hit someone since they're standing so close together. Even though you miss, you will probably hit someone else. And um, when you shoot volleys of many arrows, they come, come from above and people are forced apart. They try to stand further away from each other, not to be targeted that way. And then you start threatening them with cavalry charges. So they have to pack up once again. And then they're once again hit by the, the archery fire. So this combination gradually wore down Harold's shield wall and some rash decisions in the later part of the battle, for example, with a feigned flight by parts of the Norman cavalry broke up Harold's shield wall. And Harold was also hit, most sources say, claim in the eye by one of these arrows. Oh, so it was so a turning point. An archer probably killed Harold too. Mm -hmm. So of course it played a, a very important role in the battle. And the natural question would of course be why didn't Harold use archers himself? We don't really know, uh, and we don't. He might have, but not very, not that many, because there are sources claiming um, that the archers in William's army actually had to run forward to collect their own arrows from the battlefield. Because commonly in the Middle Ages, if both sides had archers, you would start by shoot. If you you ran out of your own arrows, you could start by shooting back the arrows aimed at you that had fallen around you. And since there was a, virtually none or no archery fire going the other way from Harold's army, the Williams archers were forced to run forward to pick up the arrows and try to return to their own lines later because they didn't have a sufficient amount for the and, that, and that worked. It worked, but of course that. They had already shot all their arrows by then, so they had already done most of their work. Uh, but this was, of course, a large logistical problem on medieval battlefields that you needed an, an, an enormous amount of arrows to make this tactic work in the long run. If you look at the individual archer mm -hmm. uh, of 1066, what kind of person was that? Was that a professional warrior or was it uh, some peasant uh, clad in armor and given a bow? Or w what degree of professionalization was there in this? In 1066, I think we know less. I'm not completely certain about this, but I think that um, we know much more about the English warriors in the Hundred Years' War, because the source material is much um, richer later in the Middle Ages. But generally, the longbow, as used in England, has been associated with a class called the yeoman, fairly, or like, self-sufficient farmers, fairly rich compared to some parts of society, but definitely not ability or anything close to that. Some so sort of lower middle class? Maybe, somewhere around that. Awesome. Yeah, they own their own land generally. And we have, for example, the Robin Hood myth in which 
in the first versions he's usually a yeoman and Robin Hood is of course very closely associated to the longbow. So can one say that after Hastings the longbow became uh, sort of a part of an English battlefield tradition? Yeah, more and more and I would say that it suddenly explodes onto the international stage in the 14th century when the Hundred Years War uh, which lasts between 1337 and 1453, so it's actually a little more than 100 years, you have two extremely important English victories that are usually, uh, that are usually talked about still and remembered. For example, we had the Agincourt uh, 600. Was it last year? Yes. Yes, of course it was last year. <laughs> Since, so it's 1415, uh, the Battle of Agincourt, and you have the Battle of Crecy in 1346. And we're going to make a special episode about Exactly. We'll talk, battles. we'll go into much more detail in yes. later episodes than we're doing now. But those are two very important English victories. And in both of these victories, the longbow played an integral or instrumental role in achieving those victories. I see. Uh, if you return to, to William, then, mm-hmm. 1066, who evidently used archers, mm-hmm. he was of Norman descent. Mm-hmm. That is Scandinavian, sort of. Well, uh, that, it's of course always problematic to talk about cultures, but Normandy had been given to Northmen uh, by the French kings. So there was partly a Nordic descent, of course, in many of the ruling people in the Norman areas, but they had been uh, part of a French cultural tradition for a few generations, at least, at this point. And also, I don't think that we should exaggerate the differences between the ruling classes of different parts of of Europe at this time. I think the the Vikings, as we like to call them, are often quite exoticized, while I think that at least the ruling classes among the Nordic uh, countries had more in common with other aristocrats uh, in continental Europe. I see. The reason I ask is that the Northmen, mm. um, which we sometimes call the Vikings, even mm. though nobody in the so-called Viking Age ever called himself a Viking, mm. um, they did not use bows as actively in, on no. the battlefield as, as those uh, Mormons did. No. They, they, they sort of they used it and then they got the axe instead. Exactly. You could say that the bow is more of a supporting weapon in uh, the Vi- most of the Viking Age sources. And um, there is no clear division between archers and melee fighters in in sources from this era. So you could definitely see many of the of the Icelandic sagas, which are of course written later, but they're supposed to reflect this period or the Viking Age. Most of these heroes are using both sometimes and then they're going over to swords axes spears and so on and we also have stories about kings using a bow they're shooting a few arrows and then they're fighting in melee combat so you can see a clear split later in the middle ages where archers are used much more distinctively they're creating massive groups of archers while before the the for example in in among the vikings if we would call them that or the northmen the i think bow, we made our point yes, yes the bow would be one of several weapons for for a warrior and yeah. but then in the antiquity there were specialized yes. archer troops weren't there yes there were but um this was usually within the framework of the what we usually call the civilized countries. Uh, notice the yeah. the tone I'm using there. Yeah. But um, <laughs> so in for in, in Rome, for example, and in several other uh, more organized countries of the time, you could say they would use archer groups. But with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, you had an influx of what we usually call the barbarian tribes and 
in these groups of people, it doesn't seem to have been as common to to have specialized forces of archers. As we don't know this for sure because we don't have sufficient source material to say this. But my guess or my <laughs> my feeling based on uh, what we have uh, source wise is that the bow was a weapon among others. Somehow in Normandy then, this this sort of proto-tradition emerges. Mm. uh, At at least there's some thought of using specialized archer. And they transfer themselves to England Mm. uh, via William the Conqueror. Mm -hmm. But that archery tradition does not remain in France. Uh, no, uh, this, but, but it becomes something typical of of, of England. Yes, right? it does. But how come only I, England? Well, can I first make the point that I'm not certain that we can trace this back to Normandy, but maybe since we know that there were archers in the Battle of Hastings, and we know that England got archers later, it's very tempting to to create this continuity, but. Uh, I think that history could have gone otherwise, perhaps, and there were also archery traditions in other peoples going starting at this time. But yes, it is tempting to see this sort of continuity. But your your other question leads me on to the question of the crossbow. Yes. Because the longbow is usually compared to the crossbow, contemporary weapon of the longbow. And the crossbow was invented long before the Middle Ages, probably in China, and then it moved westwards. There were crossbows in Roman times, for example, but then they seem to have faded away. We don't know much about any crossbows for several hundreds of years. We have vague hints from the 10th century about the use of crossbows again, Uh, but then it becomes very popular, the crossbow. And most medieval kings or most medieval realms seem to have gone with a crossbow instead of the longbow. Why? Well, of course, to answer this question, we have to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of the different weapons. And generally, you could say that the crossbow and the longbow, they fire a roughly equal distance, slightly further usually with the longbow, depending on how, how heavy the longbow is, the poundage. Just, just wait a minute. There. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Longbow, 300 yards, Mm -hmm. uh, a crossbow, flat trajectory, Mm, much shorter. uh, Yeah, slightly flatter trajectory, but usually you don't lose that much much distance with a crossbow because you usually have a, it's it's slightly stronger. Then you have the string moves a shorter distance with a crossbow, which sort of equals uh, equals that out a bit. But it's not a huge... Uh, advantage. So what is the effective distance of a crossbow? It depends of course and it develops during the Middle Ages because you get heavier and heavier crossbows but I've seen examples of 200 230 meters with late medieval crossbow. Well that's further than I thought. Right. Yeah. Sorry about Th- that. Those are late medieval versions. Uh, right. And so um, maybe you have a slight advantage then for the longbow when it comes to distance but and the crossbow is slightly better at penetrating armor, usually. It's not a huge difference there either, but usually the crossbow is slightly better, at least if it's not that far away, if it's not 300 meters. Um, the longbow is much better in the way that you can shoot many more arrows. The lowest estimates is that you shoot maybe six arrows in a minute. The highest estimates range up to 15, 20 arrows in a minute. There are many different ones. But with a crossbow, especially a heavier crossbow, you would be extremely fast if you fired more than maybe three or four crossbow bolts in a minute. And with the simpler ones, you can fire like... um uh, six yeah um, something bol- some, yeah. Yeah. and of course this is very speculative when we're, we're not giving exact uh, yes exact yes. numbers here yes. but but roughly, roughly twice the yeah. amount of arrows at least at the minute. Yes. Yeah. yeah so you can shoot much faster with a long bow. Mm-hmm. so that is a considerable advantage of course but the crossbow is easier to use the crossbow we have estimates that crossbows could be taught to people so they were decent crossbowmen in a few weeks and uh, we also see examples of when the crossbow becomes more and more popular this seems to have had a positive effect on the trade 
in Europe because merchants who previously had to hire very expensive longbowmen to defend their ships could now buy a couple of crossbows and defend themselves because it was easier to handle. And with a crossbow you also you can walk around with it loaded while with a longbow you have a considerable weight to draw back and you can only hold it there for a second or two generally at least with a battlefield cross uh, longbows mm. while so this is the big difference first of all the skill level and second of all the the strength needed by the user so what the english did now we've gone <laughs> we've taken a lo long detour to get to this but right. what the english kings did was that they started making young boys practice with the longbow uh, both to become skilled archers, of course, but also to build up their strength. So they gradually gave them heavier and heavier bows uh, so that they could use the types of bows needed to actually inflict serious damage on so the it battlefield. it was like the, the English medieval bodybuilding. <laughs> you, maybe you could, <laughs> you could phrase it they like that. They became archer Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <laughs> well... Maybe well, something say. like that. You can see a skeleton at the mm. Rose Museum, which is uh, supposed to be of a of a professional art. Mm. He he is quite deformed in his skeleton, mm. but that's that's. A Th this has also been a matter of of discussion that uh, these these deformed skeletons. That that is true. We can see the several examples of that from what we believe are professional archers, but other people have claimed that other tasks would also create the same amount of of deformity and some people argue that this has been exaggerated the deformed skeletons uh, i don't know that much about uh, osteology for example mm. so i would have to leave that to an expert to to talk about that but uh, I think at least that... But anyway, we, we see a production of archers definitely, in definitely. medieval England. Yes, in an institutionalized creation of a group of archers. And this is state power, so the state is that powerful that it can, it can actually exert, exercise power on such a low mm -hmm. level in society to produce these archers? Yes, uh, this is of course a very, very large topic as well. But you see gradually from the 13th century onwards a rise of central power in Western European countries. Before that you have a very decentralized time and but gradually the kings in France and in England and so on start to start to try to centralize power and start to try to control more and more of society. And the English kings succeed fairly well during this period. And this is one of the things that they that they try to use to achieve their their long-term goal to to create an, a weapon of mm. war. Uh, that's the same. In 1096, is it not? Uh, the, the, the Western European Christian powers uh, conquer Jerusalem, right? No, it's uh, 1099 that they actually conquered uh, Jerusalem. All right. They, so I got it wrong by three years. Yes. Thank you for but, correcting but, me. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah. so so the crossbow is called slightly earlier. But uh, exactly. in in July in but 1099, question, yes, yeah, right. they take in, the, in the late 11th century. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the Crusades, where the the Western armies, as I have heard, uh, encounter archers. Yes. Horse archers mostly. Yes. Uh, was there some kind of culture influence there that those western kings for instance Richard the Lionhearted could have seen like oh they are using archers and they're very effective can we import this in some way to my own country well it's hard to say because it's a very different archer tradition because you use horse archers right. in a very different way and uh, it is very hard to say whether that was an influence and I would say that there was a tradition going already by that time because Richard the Lionheart uh, it takes part in the Third Crusade right. so that is at the very end of the 12th century so we have another uh, hundred years no, what am I yeah, and more than a hundred years since Hastings So he's seen archers before? Yes mm. Right so this sort of very 
special tradition emerges in a peripheral part of Europe, England. The great weapon of that day was, of course, the mounted knight. Yes. Yes. That was the medieval super weapon. Yes. The, which dominated well, the, the battlefield. The high medieval super weapon, at least. How could you com- compare this mounted knight to the archer? Well, I would say that generally, if we look at the broad definition of the medieval period, you could, of course, define medieval in many different ways. But if we take a very broad definition from the fall of the Western Roman Empire, which we usually date vaguely at 476. Mm-hmm. That wasn't very vague. No, but I, like I mean that it, <laughs> it, yeah, it's exact, but it's it's maybe maybe shouldn't be that exact because it's a long. It's a process. It's a long process, but right. we usually use the year 476 to pin it down somewhere. And we usually say that the Middle Ages ended with maybe the fall of Constantinople in 1453 or the discovery of America in 1492. Those are commonly used days. So that's a thousand years. Approximately a thousand years, yes. That's That's a very broad definition, but one that works fairly well, I think. And usually we talk about an early medieval period before the year 1000 or until the early 11th century at least. Then we have a high medieval period going from around the year 1000 to roughly 1350 with the Black Death. And then a late medieval period from from 1350 to the end of the era. And what we can see during this period is that the knight, the heavily mounted um, or the the heavily armoured cavalryman, uh, becomes more and more important during the early uh, Middle Ages and then has its peak during the High Middle Ages, where the mounted cavalryman is by far the most important type of warrior on the medieval battlefields. And then gradually during the late Middle Ages, the knight fades a bit again, because new weapons and new tactics are um, utilized to defeat knights. And one of the, the things that counters the knight is the longbow archer. And there are social differences here as, uh, as well. Uh, the longbow are a yeoman, mm-hmm. uh, uh, non-nobility. Yes. Uh, and the, the knight becoming nobility, which is a political process of, mm. in order to establish military yes. powers by the states of Europe. Mm. Uh, could you in some way socially compare the longbowman to, to the mountain knight? Yeah, the knight is something that gradually comes to pass. We usually trace the origins of na- knighthood back to Charlemagne and the around the year 800 right. and gradually we see land holding men exchanging their their service as warriors to kings for for fiefs uh, some the king grants them land in in the realm <laughs> yes exactly right. so uh, and they they promise the king that they will feudalism. arrive on the battlefield yes, fe- yes. yeah this is part of feudalism right so th- they promise the king that they will arrive on the battlefield with armor and mounted Mm. and the longbow archers come from a much lower social class and some people have even wanted to portray this as a class war yes Um, i think that maybe that is or maybe more exactly class conflict yeah exactly class conflict Mm. that that you can see that there's a clear difference in class between the french knights and the English longbow archers in these famous battles of the Hundred Years' War. I would say that it's hard to tell whether they viewed it that way themselves. We have a few chronicle sources from the Middle Ages expressing disgust of longbow archers, or archers in general, because it was seen as unchivalrous, because chivalry is an important concept here, to shoot the enemy down from afar. But it's very hard to tell if the English longbow archers themselves took pride in or even thought about the fact that they were fighting warriors from a different social class on the Mm. other side because they also of course fought the common foot soldiers mustered by the french uh, nobility well one difference i'm asking now if you defeat an archer you basically kill him but if you defeat a mounted knight, a nobleman, you can hold him for ransom and get plenty of money instead. And such 
You are. Oh. Sir, you are now my prisoner and you live in my castle for three years and talk to my beautiful daughter and then we will exchange you to your, you know. Yeah. You can, we can all see Walter C. Scott movies emerging here. When archers defeated mountain knights, are the, is it true that they, they, they sort of killed them uh, with daggers um, and things like that, that they, they, they didn't care about captain? This is something capturing? that actually came up in my my master thesis right um because there's a very clear narrative in sources produced by the aristocracy of this period in which they claim that they are the honorable warriors fighting for high virtues and using just methods while there is even in the swedish source material that i was uh, looking at there are hints that they saw common folk or peasants maybe uh, as the ones representing brutality in warfare and we also know that there are a few battles in which mainly knights took part during the middle ages in which very few participants were killed because the knights took them took each other as prisoners to ransom them hostage yes right. hostages and also for example generally you would not kill the other man's war horse or the other knight's war horse because it was very valuable, very expensive. While so that's what when you're jousting yeah, with lances, not, not only jousting, but if two knights were fighting each other on the right, battlefield, right. Um, first of all, you don't aim for the horse. Uh, no, that was uh, most sources from this period seem to to claim that that was seen as unjust warfare. Right. And, but you could imagine if you are a mustard warrior and you have knights, a wave of steel riding towards you. You go for a horse. You, you just kill whatever you need to kill to survive, right. to get out of that situation and alive. And there's a storm of arrows, a rain of arrows, and the sky went black. Mm. Those arrows don't discriminate. Of course not. And also it's harder to protect the horse properly. Because at the end of the medieval period, you see knights with very, very heavy, solid plate armors, and they would be very hard to penetrate. And you also see horse armor, don't yeah, you? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You see horse armor, but the horse needs to move, uh, so it's harder to protect the ho horse properly. You can't give it a full plate armor, because <laughs> it wouldn't be able to handle that. So generally, it's easier to kill the horse, or the arrow, the arrow that comes from above would have a bigger chance of killing a horse. Right. And you also see the arrowheads, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of used on further yes. distances which are, are made for penetrating horse flesh. Exactly. More than mm -hmm. plate armor. Yeah. And you can also see, you you can of course see that these these arrows are better at penetrating chain mail than going through plate armor. Mm. Right, right. And so, it's easier to hang yeah. chain mail on a horse. That so the animal be. rights groups in France during the medieval days were extremely outraged. For yeah, they, they, <laughs> <laughs> they would have been. Um, I don't think that <laughs> I don't think that the legislation of that time protected the war mm. horses properly. Mm. But I think that the knights war horses. I think the knights themselves would care very much for that because it was a huge investment of war horse. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so, so what we see are, are two different cultures of doing battle, right? Mm. At, the, at the same time, when if, if one listens to uh, the play Henry V mm. by William Shakespeare, which depicts the Battle of Agincourt, mm. um, and that is much later than the actual battle, of battle course, much like later, a hundred yes. years later. But anyway, yeah. he, he, he does mention the archers, mm. but he seems to focus upon the knights, the English knights, mm. right? Yes. In portraying this glorious, we happy few, we band mm. of brothers. Yes. Which includes the yeoman holding mm -hmm. the, the bow, but it focuses upon the yes. knights of it. I would say that during this period, it's seen as more honorable still, or more interesting to focus on the knights who would do the actual melee fighting, while it's not as honorable or as glorious to kill an enemies from afar. But if we look at the actual Battle of Agincourt, we can see that a large majority of the English army was made up of longbow archers and they were definitely the deciding factor right right in the battle 
But you don't booze about them. Is that it? No, in, in apparently, the war not. Propaganda, you, apparently you, not. Apparently yeah. not. I would say, we will talk about this in a later episode, but I would say that sort of the longbow as a source of pride and glory is something that emerges later in English history. Now we're moving into my area here, yes. in the 19th century. Yes, but yeah. I would say yeah. that yeah. Um, during William Shakespeare's time, you would still probably not boast about it. That's very interesting. So this weapon, it, it emerges on, on the European battlefield. And the big question is, why does not then the, the French say, hey, this is a great weapon. Let's train 10,000 of our own longbowmen and get rid of those Genovese uh, mercenaries who shoot for crossbow. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, this is a very complicated question. It's very hard to tell. But we know, for example, at the end of the Hundred Years' War, the, the French started using their own longbow archers, but never on the same scale as the English. But I think also it's a matter of tradition because the English had built up these systems over a very long time. They had legislation from, I don't know the exact dates now, but they had. I think that we have laws from at least four or five different uh, occasions where English boys and men were forced to train with longbow. And I think that was not very easy to build up. Um, overnight. Right? Overnight right, for right. the French. So you had these very, very skilled crossbow mercenaries available around Europe and they they were definitely not bad warriors mm -hmm. they knew what they were doing um, but they, they they lost they lost we this is also a, a very interesting topic it's hard to tell whether they lost because they had worse weapons or if they lost due to circumstances in some of these cases but definitely there were bad tactical decisions made also by the French. They did not use their crossbowmen properly. Well, what I've read mm -hmm. is that, first of all, uh, France, you have many more million people and you, have, uh, mm -hmm. you were able to produce more mountain knights yes. than the small peripheral country of England, uh, the state of England. And at the same time, there was a reluctance to produce archers in France due to the risk of social unrest. It is it is a dangerous force mm -hmm. and if you let go, they can sort of, we don't want to pay the taxes, we don't want to do this or mm -hmm. that. But the English were more or less forced to go that way because that was the only way to, to challenge France on the, on the battlefield. What do you say about these theories? Mm, that could very well be, be true, but it's very definitely sort of a, if not Marxist, at least Marxist influenced way of thinking that you're thinking in terms of conflict between classes right. and I've also heard theories in in the same vein talking about the end of the longbow that we will also mention later that that claim that this also maybe had to do with the ruling elites of for example England didn't want people to be armed with these readily available old stringed weapons mm. and they trying to force them out to replace them with gunpowder because if you you're using a black powder weapon and you you can't make black powder yourself if you it's very hard to start an uprising if you can't get hold of black powder then if if you don't have any weapons that you can create yourself and that are efficient so if you manage to force for example the longbow out then you will take the weapons from the lower classes. Mm. I found an interesting painting uh, when I had a lecture at the History Museum of Stockholm a few weeks ago uh, of French longbow mm -hmm. archers, but they were nobility women in cognac. Mm -hmm. uh, they had quite big longbows, but they were shooting for fun, mm -hmm. uh, as I see it. Um, which is, first of all, it's fun to shoot, which could explain some things about the English tradition of, of training. but. They were women given these weapons. Is there some, would you say that there's some kind of femininity and masculinity involved in, in this? That chivalry being the male, the masculine thing to do, while anti chivalry, uh, that is, mm -hmm. the longbow. That is, you can give it to women. Yeah, that is an interesting uh, idea because since knights were all men, uh, chivalry was an enormous part of the 
the idea of masculinity among aristocratic men, in at least in the high Middle Ages, definitely, and the antithesis of or the the opposite of fighting bravely man to man on the battlefield would be to shoot your enemy cowardly from afar. Right. I suppose. And um, we, as I mentioned before, we have sources claiming a dis- that knights were disgusted or uh, hated longbow archers, not only because they were efficient, but because they felt insulted by being by suffering the risk of being killed by a dirty peasant shooting uh, who wouldn't fight man to man, so mm. to speak. So, if if you associate masculinity with melee combat, then of course you could ascribe femininity to to the longbow. Mm. But, of course, the, the English archers didn't consider themselves <laughs> feminine. No, I, I, the I, of I, I, court. I highly doubt that they considered themselves feminine since they came out of a society in which that was seen as very negative. So, uh, doing, as a this paint, doing this painting may have been some sort of notion of proto-war propaganda maybe. perhaps it, it, it's know. very very hard to tell of course we don't that's, know the circumstances that's a good thing about medieval history you have such little source material but you can always guess freely no one can tell I, you I usually I usually make uh, an analogy that when you do modern history it's like you're you're dropping something into a pond mm-hmm. and you have enormous amounts of water to search through before you find it while medieval history is more like you have a sponge with a little water left in it and you have to try to squeeze it out and do something with those few drops of water that fall out of the sponge well we 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 have started modern history and your your your, your chivalry <laughs> <laughs> well could we some in some way sort of summarize the, the medieval experience on the battlefield, the, the longbow boat used in medieval warfare. Could you in some way summarize the thoughts upon that? Yeah, I would say that it is important on several different levels. On a social level, it is a weapon of the people, as we could say. Maybe um, we're exaggerating it a little bit, but if we say pointedly, we'd say that it's a weapon of the people. Strategically, it becomes a new way to win, uh, to win battles against, for example, mounted knights, and it also and politically it becomes an important factor in the conflict between England and France, of course, and um, this conflict was important for more parts of Europe than just these two. Um, large economical interests were invested into this conflict. We know, for example, that a fairly large financial crisis in Italy at the time was created by the spread of a false rumor that the English army had been crushed. So this was, of course, a very important conflict. And since this gave the Englishmen an edge, it, it affected Europe politically as well. But we have to remember that at the end, the French actually won the Hundred Years' War. Maybe some people would not agree to this, but at least the Longbow did not decide the war in the favor of the English. So they won the important battles, but they could not be victorious. In and the, ki- the King of England this did not become the King no, of France. No, definitely That's not. Right. And gradually it actually led to the complete expulsion of the English out of France. The holdings of the English shrank, and the English kings as dukes of Aquitaine, for example, uh, lost more and more of the land and at, at the end they only had fe- small uh, stretches of land close to the channel. So you could say that this was more or less a victory of the French in, in it was the a, end. It was a medieval Brexit then. <laughs> 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 well, um, you and I, we started a, 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 an archery society together, the Sagittari Holmia, uh, mm. a Stockholm company of longbow archers. And of course, we apologize uh, primarily to our, our English listeners that two young Swedes, or young, I'm 49 years old, <laughs> one elderly Swede and one young Swede. Adam, how old mm. are you? 28. 28, right. Rather young. You're just a boy. Uh, ventures into this uh, minefield of English nationalism and, and so on and so forth, which we will touch upon in, in further episodes. Uh, 
But anyway, we would like to thank you for listening to this episode, dear listener. Um, and Adam, when will you shoot the bow next time? I don't really know. <laughs> you keep inviting me to these things. But well, you're the chairman of it. Yes, I, I should be able. I should shoot much more often. But mm-hmm. I hope it will be a Sunday in a few weeks yes. because we have a few activities planned. So we we were quite active. The senior captain. And of course, as we say in Game of Thrones, winter is coming. Thank you. And the sky went black. Tales and history of a longbow with Henrik Arnstad and Adam Westlund.